Hello and welcome back. This is part three in my little mini series on helicycle wiring. Uh, you're looking at a couple modern aerospace connectors. These are called D38999 Series 3. Uh, they're very expensive. There's no way we can afford them, but they represent uh, modern interconnect technology for harsh environments and uh, aerospace applications. They're uh, made by companies like ITT Cannon, Glenair, Deutsch, and Amphenol. You'll find them in aircraft like the uh, F-35 Strike Fighter, the Boeing uh, Dreamliner, the Predator, uh, modern uh, high-performance uh, military and civilian aircraft like that. And also you'll find them in outer space in uh, geosynchronous communication satellites. So these are designed to operate in very harsh environments where failure is not an option. The reason that I'm showing you these is that they have all the, the characteristics in the connector that we want to see in an inexpensive one that we can afford to buy. Let's take a look. Here's a list of some of the uh, features of these connectors that I think are important for us to look for in something that's affordable for the helicycle. Shock and vibration resistance, of course, is pretty critical. We don't want the connector to demate in flight. That would not be good. Uh, high density contact uh, arrangements are, are important to save, uh, save space and volume. These little guys can handle uh, 36 contacts, so you could have 12 shielded twisted pairs, including the uh, shield pigtails, passing through uh, this, this mated pair of connectors. That's a plus. Uh, we definitely want machined contacts. The, the best ones are gold plated, although nickel plating is just fine. But the main thing is to avoid uh, stamped uh, contacts that are made out of sheet metal. You want machined contacts and they should be plated either gold or nickel. Uh, visible indication of full mating is important. You want to be able to look at the connector and know that it is locked uh, to its mate and it's not going to come loose. Um, an internal uh, conductor strain relief is also critical. Uh, typically uh, the contact is pushed well into the connector body through a big rubber uh, gasket in the back. And so that rubber acts as a strain relief and also uh, seals the contact area against uh, moisture intrusion. So that's an important feature. Uh, as I say, they're environmentally sealed by that rubber. So we want to look for connectors that have uh, gaskets and, and O-rings and things like that to protect them. Uh, these have multiple keying options. That's a plus and it prevents you from, from cross-connecting a couple connectors uh, that are using the same shell size connector. So say you have uh, five uh, connectors in rows all uh, on a little bulkhead or on a box like I have an interface chassis, you want to make it impossible to cross connect any of those cables and get them on the wrong connector. So multiple keying options is a plus if you can find it. Otherwise uh, you should pay attention and use dissimilar styles or sizes or shapes or number of contacts uh, to prevent uh, hooking up your cable to the wrong connector. These connectors are either uh, metal or composite which are plated with uh, typically with nickel so they're EMI RFI shielded. Um, that's, a, that's a plus if you can find them and they also have recessed contacts which are scoop proof and what that means is uh, if you can see the uh, the plug on the right, it has female contacts and they're tucked away back behind the face of the uh, connector that you can just barely see there. The one on the left, the bulkhead mount, is a male so it has pins which are protruding 
uh, out of the back of the connector. However, the recess down inside the barrel of, of the, uh, the body of the connector. So there's no way when you're thrashing around trying to mate these that you can uh, scoop across the pins and bend them. That's what that means. So they're, they're uh, recessed far enough so that they're protected from mechanical damage and that's what we're looking for. So these are all features we want in something that's affordable. Okay, now let's look at some connectors that we can actually afford. Here we're looking at a close-up of the back of my interface chassis, which mounts under my instrument pod and ties a lot of the wiring uh, from the ship and to and from the upper and the lower instrument panels. Uh, the upper connector uh, has 50 contacts, the one below it has 37, uh, and you're looking at the back shells. The connectors are, uh, are hidden away from view at the moment. Uh, this family of connector is called D sub miniature, or D sub for short. They're ubiquitous, they're all over the place. Uh, you will never find these on a military or, uh, or a commercial aircraft, however, but um, they are used fairly frequently in home built. Uh, airplanes. I don't know about uh, uh, production uh, light aircraft. I, I'm not aware of what what they do uh, one way or the other. But I know that Vans uses these in their kits and uh, Garmin and Icom Avionics all use uh, these miniature connectors and all of the UMA indicators that I sell have uh, nine pin uh, male uh, D subs on the back. So they're, they're in fairly common use uh, in home built. So going through the list of desirable criteria again, so shock and vibration proof, not so much. So we have to be careful there. Uh, we've got the high density contact arrangements covered. We've got the machine gold plated contacts. Uh, visible indication of full mating. Uh, you have to be careful there. Uh, these are not idiot proof. Um, internal conductor strain reliefs. No, the connector itself uh, has no strain relief whatsoever, but the back shells uh, do usually and the ones that I'm using here you can see in the foreground those are the strain reliefs and uh, there's a piece which you can barely see uh, on these little clamps on the inside uh, surface top and bottom I've put a piece of uh, thick spongy uh, tape to cushion the uh, the wires inside there when I when I apply pressure with these little uh, little clamping pieces so I don't uh, crush the insulation so they are strain relieved but not the connector itself it's up to the back shell to do that and that's a separate uh, line item that you have to purchase they're not environmentally sealed so we want to keep these inside the cabin uh, you wouldn't use these uh, out on the on the frame somewhere because they're they're not sealed. Uh, multiple keying options? No, there are not multiple keying keying options. But what I've done here to get around that is the top connector is a 50 pin, the second one down is a 37 pin, the one below that which isn't plugged in at the moment is a 25 pin. So there's no way I can get these backwards because they're, they're physically different sized. The other thing I could do is reverse the sex. So if I needed to have 250 pin, let's say side by side, I could have the cable uh, one be male on one and female on the other and the, uh, the bulkhead ones, you know, mates to those two. So again, I could uh, get around the fact that there are no keying options by reversing the sex or changing the, the uh, connector size. EMI RFI shielding. Uh, the way these are set up with these metal back shells, uh, they are shielded. So that's good. 
uh, recessed contacts that are scoop proof um, not not to the degree of the uh, of the mill circular connector that I showed you initially uh, the pins on the male connectors uh, are protected a little bit but uh, they're not idiot proof you could bend the pin if you scraped it up against a, a, a protruding screw or something like that so uh, they're not totally idiot proof but um, I think you know, if you if you are prudent and you select your parts appropriately, um, they will get the job done. Uh, getting back for a moment to shock and vibration uh, proof uh, criteria, uh, there are two ways of locking these things down. Uh, in the foreground on the left, you can see that there are little clips that are mounted to the chassis and they snap into the little ears that are on the uh, on the connectors and they lock them into place <clears throat> again this is not as idiot proof as the mill connectors the aerospace connector that I showed you but instead of costing you know seven hundred dollars for a pair uh, we're down to you know whatever twenty or thirty bucks depending on the size and where you get them um, so there's two two basic ways you can lock these things down. One is with these little clips, um, which are a bit troublesome. Uh, sometimes the the clip itself will just pop loose and go flying off somewhere, and that can be a real pain in the neck. Um, but I think once they're in position, they're probably okay. Uh, but again, it's not perfect. The other way which I may go to, I'm, I'm still uh, thinking about whether I trust these clips enough to go with this route. The other way is you simply screw the connector down uh, with a screw and a little captive uh, uh, piece that, that keeps the screw from falling out. And I'll show you that later. So that would be fairly, uh, a fairly safe approach but you know if you're constantly removing and installing the connectors it's it's uh, a bit awkward and it's a pain because you got to get out a little screwdriver and fiddle around so again not quite as good as the uh, mill circular connector but you know at the, at the price uh, difference between the two we're going to have to accept a few things that are not quite perfect so um, I think these are viable options. Uh, I'm, I'm using them on the helicopter that I'm working on at the moment. Uh, this is the first time I've used this type on a helicycle, and it's not, you know, it's not close to flying yet. So we don't, we don't have any uh, any hard data to say, yeah, the thing's been flying for a long time and nothing's gone wrong. So this jury's still out on whether these little clips are good enough to hold everything in place. Uh, what I've done is in the design of the wiring, I've made sure that no critical wiring goes through these connectors. So even if every connect, every D sub on this particular helicycle were to fall off in flight, the engine will continue to run. I'd lose all the lighting and instrumentation and everything else, but the engine would keep running. So I'm hedging my bets a little bit. Here's a picture of uh, male contacts for the D-subs. You can see that they're high quality. One giveaway is the, uh, the color-coded stripes on, on each contact. Those uh, different colors identify which uh, part number those are so you can verify that you've got the right contact for the right connector. You'll also notice, uh, looking forward from the white band on these things, uh, in a couple of them you can see uh, they're oriented so you see that there's a hole on the side. Like in the upper right, there's a, there's a contact with the hole exposed. That's an inspection hole. After you've made your crimp, you want to look in there and verify that the wire is visible in that hole. The crimp will take place centered more or less where the blue stripe is 
the crimp should happen uh, between the uh, the two extreme ends of this of the colored stripes so it should happen right in the middle there so you want to make sure wire extends all the way through the crimp zone and out the other side and it's visible through that little hole so that's what the holes for here's some tooling these are removal extraction tools for the D sub size contacts when you're inserting a wire you use the red side on the ones on the bottom uh, when you're extracting you use the white side the tool at the top which is the most expensive and highest quality uh, only is a removal tool and you can see the part number if you uh, want to go buy one MS 27495R22 those things will set you back I don't know 40 bucks or something the one in the middle is the cheapest those are disposable those are a couple bucks the one below it has metal tips uh, the middle parts plastic and it's I don't know six bucks something like that I don't have the part numbers handy for those two but you should be able to dig them up um, you use as I say the red side for insertion most times you don't need a tool you can insert the uh, the contacts into the D subs simply by grabbing the wire at the insulated area like a half inch behind the crimp and just carefully poking it down into the hole and just slowly push it in until you feel it click once it clicks then give a good tug make sure it doesn't come back out uh, you can also visually inspect on the other side and see if it's protruding the right length and that's all you need I very seldom need uh, to use the insertion side of these tools removing a contact uh, can it be anywhere from fairly simple to downright impossible uh, depending on the thickness of the insulation it may be impossible to remove or extract a contact once it's inserted and so I've run into a situation where I finally had to give up and just dike all of the wires off flush with the back of the connector throw the connector in the trash and start over because I accidentally inserted a wire into the wrong position something like that so be careful uh, inserting is a lot easier than removing so make sure you uh, you do it right the first time so you don't need to do uh, a removal here's the crimp tool you want to use with these D sub connectors the connectors are inexpensive the crimp tool is not this one is made by DMC Daniels Manufacturing uh, Corporation and the part number is AFM Alpha Foxtrot Mike 8 the military designation is M is in Mike 22520/2-01 I bought this new you can find them on eBay uh, new they're around 200 bucks I think from Daniels and uh, used on eBay you can find them for less but they hold up their value pretty good that's why I decided to buy a new one the used ones weren't that much cheaper uh, it's an exquisite little tool um, like all of the uh, contacts on all of the uh, connectors that uh, I'm going to suggest you might want to use on your helicycle they all use machined uh, precision uh, contacts and you always want to use a self-completing ratchet crimper like this never never crimp uh, contact with some crappy tool you got from the hardware store or at a garage sale throw that stuff out um, this is as I say this is a precision tool it's going to cost you a few bucks but they hold up their value uh, when you're done you can always sell it used Well, hopefully you've recovered from the high cost of the uh, crimp tool because now I've got some more bad news for you for every different kind of contact that you're going to crimp you're gonna need a positioner and this is what they look like 
These things sell for about 80 bucks a piece. They're just little little guys. This is way, uh, depending on your screen size, this is you know like three times what the size is. The diameter of these things is about like a quarter, and they're maybe an inch, uh, an inch deep. What it does, if you look at the one on the right, there's a precision hole down the middle of this thing that just accepts a uh, contact uh, that is designed for, and it positions it right in the middle of the tool, and it positions the depth of the contact so that the area to be crimped is located in the proper spot in the tool right in the middle of the jaws. So that's that's the purpose of, of this guy. And uh, after buying two of these, I couldn't I couldn't bear to to spend another 80 bucks on another one. So when I needed a, a third type of uh, positioner, I just made one on my lathe. It, it took a while to get it just right, and it's pretty hokey. It doesn't uh, it doesn't have little ears on it, so I can't lock it in position or anything. I just stuff it down in the hole and. Uh, and then put some masking tape over it to hold it in position. But it gets the job done and I didn't have to spend any money. Here's the back side of one of these and for the, the, the uh, contacts that this one's designed for you can see that that particular contact will accept four different wire sizes from 28 all the way up to 22. And depending on the size of the wire inside the contact the depth of the crimp needs to be adjusted to make a good crimp. If you set it on 5 for a number 22 wire but you actually had a 28 in there the crimp would not be deep enough and you wouldn't have a good crimp. So uh, you first uh, have to, to get the right uh, positioners then you've got to make sure you uh, do your homework uh, determine what what size wire you're using for that particular contact figure out what the selector setting is and then we go to the next slide and I'll show you how that works so once you've done all that then you simply uh, lift up on the middle of this little guy rotate it around until the arrow points to the selector uh, depth number and then drop it into a detent and it locks in position now you're ready to go. So when you uh, stick your your uh, contact down into the center of the crimp tool, the contact's going to go in exactly the right depth. It's going to be centered perfectly by the positioner. And when you squeeze the ratchet, it's not going to let you release it until it gets all the way done, at which point the four jaws, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, have penetrated into the uh, four sides of the contact the exact right amount to make a perfect crimp. Here you see the business side of the, the crimp tool. Contact would go uh, right down inside the middle um, from this side. This is the bottom of the tool. As you, as you, all these other pictures you've been looking at, let's call that the top side. So the contact goes in through this side and uh, normally this would be face down so when you insert it the, the contact is sitting on top of the wire and it's not going to, gravity is you know holding it in position, it's not going to fall off. So that's how I do it. So I have the wire uh, pointing up with the uh, contact sitting on top of it. I insert it in the hole all the way uh, until I can tell I've, I've bottomed out inside the positioner and then I crimp it. These four jaws all come down equally from all four sides. They make a perfect crimp. Once the, uh, the, the crimp is completed then the ratchet will release and you're done. And that's it. Here's a couple part numbers for you. This is a 9 pin uh, D sub and this is a good quality one made by Tyco. Um, the part number is Amazon Mary 24308 slash 4 1. Now that 24308 describes D subs, that's the spec. And then the slash 4 1 
that tells you the size and the sex of the connector so you can look that up you can figure it out so if you wanted to get a 25 pin male or a 37 pin female you can derive it from uh, that number that I gave you with a little homework um, and what you're looking for uh, there's a lot of Chinese knockoffs out there I think they're probably alright but um, usually know when you've got a really good one if it actually has a, a manufacturer part number on it and the uh, the contacts typically come in a little bitty pill bottle like you see in the lower left of that bag they're all bagged up and the and the contacts have their own part number that's a good sign also uh, the manufacturer number or his name or something will be on the connector body itself if everything's all blank there's no uh, stripes on the terminals and they're just loose in the bag you've got a Chinese knockoff not necessarily the end of the world but you should be aware that uh, it's not you know it probably doesn't conform to uh, to mill spec here's an example of the back shells that I'm using uh, that number same idea here uh, the uh, prefix is the spec for the back shell and then after the slash tells you what size and so forth and so on this is Amazon Mary 85049 slash 48-1-3 so again uh, if you noodle around uh, using that number you'll be able to figure out what the part number is for the various sizes I think this one's either 25 or 37 pin and you can see what comes with it uh, you get locking nuts screws and uh, the two clamps that go on the back for the strain relief and that's it um, so that and the connector uh, get you close then you need some way to clamp the connector down uh, or, or hook it to its mate if they're both free floating um, and I will try and put a slide in uh, uh, after this one to explain how to do that here you're looking at uh, connector installed on the back of uh, UMA a custom indicator that I sell and let me point out one method of uh, hooking these up right here you have this little clip that goes around and snaps into position see that and a screw and it goes into this little standoff on the back of the mating connector this keeps the screw semi captive they tend to fall out if you're not careful but if you don't unscrew it all the way it will remain uh, attached so it doesn't get lost um, this thing is called a screw retainer kit and I'm going to give you a Tyco part number 5205980-1 so you get two clips and two screws and I've seen them on Mauser and a couple other places for less than a buck so that's one that's one way to do it which I may go to instead of those clips um, next I'll give you the uh, part number for the clips and of course the little uh, clip is one part number and the uh, the mating piece is another completely different number so nothing simple all right we're almost at the end of this video um, I'm going to give you a couple part numbers in a second for these uh, latch assemblies this is a little bit confusing um, I've got a number of different uh, manufacturers and different uh, part numbers and I'm looking at the little baggies and um, there seems to be some inconsistencies here so you'll have to do a little bit of homework if you go this route the thing to remember is that there are two widths for these D subs the 9, 15, 25, and 37 pin connectors all have two rows of contacts and they're all the same width so the clips or the, the clip assemblies let's call them 
uh, would be all the same for those. But the 50 pin on the right have three rows of contacts and so they're fatter as you can see in this picture. Hence they take a completely different uh, part. The clip is wider and so is that little retaining piece there. Uh, so here come some numbers. This is uh, what I'm looking at is a baggie that has one clip and one of the little retainer uh, sheet metal pieces and a screw, a nut, and a washer. So you only have one side in this bag so you'd have to order two of these things. This is for a 50 pin. It's an ITT Canon part number 1102790-0. Let me give you that again. 110279-0000. So that appears to be half of what you need. Now here's another one. And this doesn't have the clip. It's only the sheet metal piece. It's an ITT Canon part number as well. It is 110280-0000. So you can look those two up and see what, uh, what you come up with. Now here's another part. This company is called uh, Fernell, F-E-R-N-E-L-L. -L. Their part number is 118-6663. And it looks like I have everything I need plus a few other things in here. At least enough for one, con uh, one connector. I've got both sides of what looks like the thinner type. So this would be for the 9 through 37 pin. And it looks like it's got everything you need in this one part number, this little kit. So um, those three numbers between them should give you enough to get you going if you decide to go this way. Now again, uh, I don't know that these are going to be 100% foolproof uh, in the helicycle, especially if you're not balanced that great and there's some vibration. Uh, I have had problems with one of these little spring clips flying loose and I think the connector wasn't fully seated. I tried to jam it in there and it got cockeyed and the next thing I know, poing, off it went. Um, once they're in there properly, they seem to stay. Um, so I'm not sure whether I had one defective one or it wasn't installed all the way or what. But uh, I'm a little suspicious of these things at this point. So uh, Again, in the previous slide, I, I showed you a different way you can go where you just screw these things down and you're done. Um, this, of course, has the benefit of it's a lot easier and simpler, especially, you know, when you're troubleshooting and you're doing construction. I've had these things on and off, you know, 15 times now at least. And you just go clip, clip, pull it off, do whatever you're doing, stick it back on, snap, snap, and you're done. With the screw method, you got to get your screwdriver out, unscrew the little screws, hope they don't fall out of the retainer and fall down inside your panel somewhere, and then you got to reverse the process. Those screws, by the way, uh, the threads don't go all the way up, so the shank up near the head of the screw has no threads, and that's the part where the retainers, you know, it should it should hold it because of that feature. So when you assemble the thing, you screw the screw all the way through. So the threads go all the way through the retainer and then it's just sort of flopping around there uh, by the shank. That's the idea. Um, although uh, the trick is when you're taking the connector off, don't unscrew the screw too far or it will fall out of the retainer. So I think that's it for uh, for D sub connectors, seems like I've been I've been working on this thing for most of the day and the morning and the afternoon, and uh, I think that's enough for this one. I think I forgot to give you the Fresnel part number, so here it comes: one one eight six 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 three. 
So this appears to be for the uh, the thinner two row connectors which would be DB9 through DB37 and this one bag contains enough for both sides plus I can feel seems like there's a few extra things in here in this bag I don't want to rip it open because I'll have little parts spilled all over the place so uh, between those three numbers uh, and uh, a little homework uh, using Google I think you can find what you need if you decide to go that route so um, that's it I'm gonna wrap this one up for uh, DB uh, connectors the D subs and I'll, I'll make another video uh, on uh, the Deutsch connectors that I'm using those those are more weatherproof so uh, where I might use those is out on the back of the aircraft uh, although I'm using some inside I also should uh, comment on on why you might want to put a connector in line somewhere initially I was going to wire from the actuators and the sensors all the way up to the instrument panel and be done with it and then when I sat down to think about that I thought okay uh, how exactly am I going to do that uh, that's going to be a little bit awkward because the seat pan uh, you know everything goes through the seat pan the instrument pot is on one side of the seat pan where you are and the wiring goes down underneath and uh, goes along the frame and so if it's one continuous shot and you have no way to disconnect anything you could never get that seat pan out again without tearing everything apart you also could never remove the instrument panels so everything would be permanently tied into place and immovable and so um, I've basically taken all of the uh, all of the cables that tie things together everything going from the upper panel to the lower panel everything going from either one of those panels out to the rest of the ship and anything going from any of those three spots to my interface chassis and I've said okay um, if there already isn't a way to uh, to disconnect that particular uh, cable bundle if there's no connector somewhere already I'm gonna whack this cable in half and connectorize it so that if I need to I can pull out the upper instrument panel I can pull off the lower instrument panel I can remove the seat pan um, simply by disconnecting connectors now the downside of that is you you know every time you add complexity uh, there's more chance something's going to go wrong uh, the more parts you have uh, the higher the risk of failure etc 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 so when you do something like that you've got to give some serious thought to um, you know the, the unintended consequences uh, for example since I don't 100% trust these D subs to stay uh, mated in flight because I don't trust those spring clips that much. Uh, I have simply taken all of the critical wiring and bypassed those connectors. So every single D sub can fall out in flight. And uh, this helicopter I'm working on, the engine will still continue to run. You'll lose all your instruments, your lighting, your radio, everything else will go dead. But you'll still be in the air and you'll still be flying. You're not going to be falling out of the sky. So, um, you know, there's all, all kinds of things to consider when you're doing wiring. And they're not always obvious. So I always just play what if for a couple days before I do anything, pretty much. So um, I think that's it. Um, again, I'll do one more on, uh, on these Deutsch connectors that I'm using, and then I think I've pretty much exhausted uh, an overview of wiring. I hope this is of use to you guys. And if after watching all this, you're about to give up and say, this is too much work, all I want to do is fly a helicycle. I don't want to spend years building it. 
I happen to be putting one up for sale and you happen to be looking at it right now. So if you'd like to just buy a helicycle and go flying, I'm your man. Give me a call, send me an email. N750 Golf there, uh, it won, uh, it won uh, top award at, uh, at the local uh, air show in Watsonville here. Uh, and uh, it's very, very smooth flying ship. It's Ferrari Red. I've spent uh, over a thousand bucks just on the paint job. And it has uh, a lot of other features, which you can find out about by going to my website, uh, where I'm also selling a partially completed helicycle kit. So I'm your one-stop helicopter place if you would like helicycles. Go to www.helicycles, H-E-L-I-C-Y-C-L-E-S dot O-R-G. And you'll see everything uh, there is to know about this one as well as my kit. I've got like 400 pages of builder logs and a bunch of videos and all sorts of stuff on this one. Um, and uh, if you'd like to drop me an email, if you have any questions or comments or there's something that I haven't covered, uh, now's the time to, uh, to let me know and I'll stick it in this last video before I uh, fade back into the woodwork. You can contact me at Juan, J-U-A-N, at helicycles.org. So I hope this was of use to you, and thanks for watching.